Now it's recording. Okay, now it's working. <laughs> it needs to be the red light. Yeah. Numbers chapter 12. Verse 1. Everybody found numbers? You guys are great. You are much better than the guys down the road who don't bring their Bibles to church at all. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, You three come to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent. And he called Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? So the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he departed. But when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. As Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. Then Aaron said to Moses, O oh, my Lord, I beg you, do not account this sin to us in which we have acted foolishly and in which we have sinned. O oh, do not let her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. Moses cried to the Lord, saying, O oh God, heal her, I pray. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp, and afterward she may be received again. So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until Miriam was received again. Afterward, however, the people moved out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Go ahead and be seated. One of the first mentions of leprosy in the scripture. And our teaching tonight is going to be about leprosy, of course. Just backing up a little bit to Matthew 7, uh, 28, the end of the chapter, it says, The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, words of the Sermon on the Mount, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. He was teach for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. And the way uh, their scribes who were what we would call a rabbi today. There was a little bit of a, a distinction between the scribes of that day and the rabbis of that day. Uh, but now the rabbis are ministers of congregations and they are the teachers. But the teaching is done under someone else's authority. By the authority of Rabbi so-and-so, who was quoting from Rabbi so-and-so, uh, here's the teaching. Jesus didn't do that. He said, you've heard from these guys an eye for an eye. But I tell you, don't resist an evil man. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. That was the authority that Jesus projected. As we go through this, don't forget that the greater context 
is the kingdom of kingdom of heaven, as Matthew puts it. From that time, in Matthew 4.17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is the context of everything in the Gospel of Matthew. And in reality, it is the basic theme of the entire Bible, the kingdom. So immediately after the Sermon on the Mount, where people are amazed at the authority that Jesus speaks with, uh, in Matthew we have, I believe it's nine, miracle stories. And each of these miracle stories uh, speak to something of Jesus' authority. He backs up his authority with actions. Uh, each of these stories is found in the other synoptic Gospels, and a few of them in John. John is the one that is not of the synoptics. John tells the story quite differently. Matthew, Mark, and Luke essentially tell the same story, but a bit differently. The miracle stories in Matthew are all gathered together. In Mark and Luke, we'll find them kind of scattered here and there. And in some cases, we find more information. Uh, Matthew kind of shortens them uh, and makes his points quickly. But all of these stories serve to establish Jesus' authority. And it says in Matthew 8, 1, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. He was very popular. But as we look at these miracle stories, that's not his purpose. His not, purpose is not uh, to be popular. Uh, his purpose is, once again, to establish the fact of who he is uh, and to minister humbly to uh, the people of Israel as he put, puts it in one place, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it says, Behold, a leper came to him, and uh, NASB says, bowed down to him. Other versions say, worshipped him. Uh, the word in Greek is uh, essentially the same. But he bowed down to him to show his Submission, his surrender, uh, his understanding of Jesus as the Messiah. He comes to him because he sees in him, he heard, he heard his words, and he heard his authority. And he speaks with the authority of the Messiah. You know, they weren't in the dark. Uh, the coming of the Messiah was not a surprise. Uh, some of them were surprised by what kind of Messiah he turned out to be. Uh, but this man apparently understood. There was a uh, there were numerous accounts of leprosy uh, back in the Old Testament. We'll talk about a few of them. But we see Miriam struck with leprosy, and she had to sit outside the camp for seven days before she could be healed. This happened before the law was given. Under the law, no leper uh, is recorded as ever having been healed in Israel. So when Jesus heals a leper, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Uh, there are certain miracles that only the Messiah could do by their own tradition. Uh, we'll see uh, another one that comes up uh, shortly about uh, the casting out of a demon from a man who is uh, blind and deaf. Or was it blind, deaf, and dumb, or was it just blind and dumb? 
I don't remember. But he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If it is your will, you can cleanse me. Just a, a thing about leprosy. Uh, nowadays, we call it Hansen's disease, I think. Is that right, Larry? Correct. Uh, it's possible, though, that the leprosy that we see in the Old Testament is similar but not the same thing as Hansen's. Uh, some people have studied it and said that the leprosy depicted in the Old Testament uh, is actually gone from the earth uh, at this point. Um, Maybe, maybe not. It's irrelevant. It says, though, uh, my note here, the leprosy begins with the loss of all sensation in some parts of the body. Uh, the nerve trunks are affected. Uh, in essence, leprosy is a nervous disorder. It is a degeneration of the nervous system. So without the nerves supporting them, the muscles waste away. The tendons contract until the hands are like claws. There follows ulceration of the hands and feet. And then comes the progressive loss of fingers and toes until in the end, a whole hand or a whole foot might drop off. The duration of that kind of leprosy is anything from 20 to 30 years, a slow death. It is a kind of terrible progressive death in which a man dies by inches. According to the Jewish law and customs, one had to keep six feet from a leper. Hey, social distancing, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's where it came from. I, it, I don't know. Did, nobody really knows where the six-foot le limit comes from. Uh, if a wind was blowing toward a person from a leper, they had to keep 150 feet away. And the only thing more defiling than contact with a leper was contact with a dead body. Uh, for all these reasons, the condition of leprosy is a model of sin and its effects. It is a contagious, debilitating disease that corrupts its victim and makes him essentially dead while alive. In fact, in the uh, in the Middle Ages, if somebody contracted leprosy, a, a priest would come and give them last rites. They may be 20 years away from actual death, but they, they uh, would give them last rites. <coughs> Rabbis especially uh, despised lepers and saw them as people under the special judgment of God, deserving no pity or mercy. In fact, it was considered okay to throw rocks at lepers. And they had to uh, hang a sign around their neck and constantly call out, unclean, unclean. And they had to stay outside of walled cities. Luke gives us, you know, being that he's a doctor, he gives us one little bit of bit of information it says it came about that while he was in one of the cities behold there was a man full of leprosy or with the fullness of leprosy the disease was uh, fully developed within him and he was probably close to death he was in the end stages so we just read the story of uh, of Aaron and uh, Mary, Mary. Mary, okay. Uh, just to recap it, uh, it says, The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he departed. And when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, white as snow. As Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. But, but Miriam was healed. Now there were many lepers throughout Old Testament uh, history, but none of them were, were healed. There's an interesting uh, scripture in Isaiah uh, that is usually used as an uh, uh, 
indication that God is ready and willing to forgive our sins. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. And most commentators will say that that is a picture of God's willingness to forgive us. But there's kind of a minority report that has uh, some uh, validity, possibly. It says, your sins are scarlet, but they will be white as snow, is using leprosy as a picture. Uh, and God is saying, your sins are just red now. That's the beginning stages of leprosy. But they will become white as snow, which is like the end stages of leprosy. And though they are red like crimson, once again, the beginning of leprosy, they will be like wool, the end stages of leprosy. Like I say, this is a minority report, and as the uh, uh, scripture proceeds, it's clear that God is saying, you know, I'm ready here to forgive you at any point. So, I'm leaving it up to you on that one. <laughs> we have the story of Uzziah in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 19. Uzziah, with a censer in his hand for burning incense, was enraged. He was enraged because the priests told him, you're the king. You have no business going into the temple and burning incense. And while he was enraged with the priests, the leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord, beside the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous on his forehead. And he hurried him out of there, and he himself also hastened to get out, because the Lord had smitten him. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And he lived in a separate house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. So his leprosy stayed with him for the rest of his life, even though he was one of the good kings of Judah. Uh, and his, he had to live outside, and his son became the uh, regent over Israel. He was not healed. But we do have one example in the Old Testament of someone who was healed of leprosy. It says in first, uh, Second Kings 5.1, Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected uh, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. This man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. And, you know, most of us know the story about how he was uh, uh, directed uh, to the prophet uh, Elisha of Israel. And he was told to go bathe three times in the Jordan River. And at first he refused, but then he decided, hey, this is worth a try anyway. So he went and did it, and he was cleansed. So Uzziah, the king of Judah, was not healed of his leprosy. Now Ammon, the Syrian general, was healed of his leprosy. And once again, we have no account of anybody in Israel during the period that the law was in effect being healed of leprosy. But they did have a very long ritual regarding someone who was cleansed of leprosy. It says in Matthew 8.3 that Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So for the first time, under the law, a leper was cleansed of his leprosy. Fulfilling their own tradition, 
the tradition of the Jews at that time, that when Messiah comes, he'll be able to cleanse leprosy. Now, there were miracle workers in the land of Judah and in Galilee at the time. But they couldn't cure leprosy. But Jesus touched him. You know, you we weren't supposed to touch a leper. Uh, that meant that you were unclean for a time. But immediately, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go, show yourself to the priest, and present the offering that Moses commanded for a testimony to them. Well, that sounds simple, right? Just go and make the offering, right? Well, you've got to show up. The priest has to inspect it. they got to check the temple records to make sure, yeah, this guy actually was uh, adjudicated to have leprosy sometime in the past. Uh, and, you know, we told him he had to stay outside the city. He had to carry the sign. He had to call out unclean, uh, do all that stuff. Now he go, has to go back to the temple and say, I've been cleansed of leprosy. Unheard of. Amazing. It says, now we could go to uh, uh, Leviticus and read the whole process, but I've got a shortened version here, so we don't have to read the whole thing. Uh, the prescribed ritual for the healed the leper is of interest. Three separate cer ceremonies are required. For the first day... Leviticus 14, 2 through 8, also invoked for houses, uh, Leviticus 14, 48 to 53, uh, the seventh day and the eighth day. So this is an eight-day procedure that he, this guy had to go and hang out in the temple. And each day, the priest had to look at him and say, yep, your leprosy's gone. The first day ritual is performed by the priest outside the camp or city from which the leper has been banished. Cedar wood, crimson cloth, and a live bird are dipped into an earthen vessel containing a mixture of fresh water and the blood of a second bird. The leper, or leper's house, is sprinkled with this mixture seven times, after which the live bird is set free. The leper is admitted into the camp or city after he washes his clothes, shaves all his hair, and bathes, but he is not allowed to enter his residence. That is permitted him on the seventh day, after shaving, laundering, and bathing again. On the eighth day, he brings to the sanctuary oil and sheep for various offerings. Whole offering, meal offering, purification offering, and reparation offering. The whole and purification animals may be commuted to birds if the leper is poor. However, the reparation lamb and log of oil may not be changed because the blood of the lamb and the oil are needed to daub the leper's right earlobe, right thumb, and right big toe. Now you know what's involved in cleaning, cleansing a leper. Uh, so this guy goes up to the temple and says, here I am. I need to uh, go through that ceremony that you have studied uh, when you went for your ordination. Uh, you know, you had to be tested on it and all that, but you've never done it. And I'm the first. Mark gives us the information in Mark chapter 1, verse 45, that he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news about to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city that stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. So it's like Jesus had taken the punishment for the leprosy upon himself. He didn't go into cities. He stayed outside like a leper would. And that's the story of the leper in Matthew. <coughs> we ended with 
a quote from Mark about how the guy went out and told everybody what Jesus did, even though Jesus told him not to do that. Uh, and Mark couples the story with the, um, the story of the guy who is paralyzed. Um, and Mark is the one that tells us about how they couldn't get in to see Jesus, so they went up on top of the house and pulled one of the tiles, you know, big roof tiles out, and dropped him down uh, in the house. Matthew doesn't go into that uh, bit of information because he is making his points quickly. But I can, you can see a connection, a connection with sin. Leprosy is a picture of the sinful nature of man. It says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, Behold, they were bringing to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Someone who is, you know, his nerves are damaged to the point where nothing works. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Take courage, my son, your sins are forgiven. Whoa, now there's something they didn't expect. Your sins are forgiven. Well, that shocked a few people. It says, Behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, or possibly among themselves, this fellow blasphemes. Well, they, were, they would be correct if Jesus was just a regular guy. If he was just a regular person that says, your sins are forgiven, they, they would be correct. That would be blasphemy. But Jesus is the one that we see in Daniel chapter 7, one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. <clears throat> they were just shocked. They had an attack of the vapor. They needed to get their smelling salts out to revive themselves. Only God can forgive sins. God is ultimately the one who is offended by every sin. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? Well, I don't know. I, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven, I think. You know, but... I think the point is that you or I could not say that effectively any more than we could say, rise and walk. But he says, in order that you may know that the Son of Man has on authority on earth to forgive sins, and he said to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed, and go home. And he rose went home. And it says that when the multitude saw this, they were filled with awe and glorified God who has given such authority to men. This authority over leprosy. This authority over sin. All of these miracle stories establish Jesus in his authority over some aspect of our lives. So we're going to see later he has authority over the weather. But leprosy and paralysis and diseases of every sort are a result of human sin. Not directly. I mean, that that is not a, uh, a proper way of thinking that, well, because I did this, I got, you know, I've been struck with this disease. No, that's not how it works. It's more, much more general. Disease 
uh, disabilities of all sorts, uh, a basic degeneration of the genome uh, have occurred because of our sin, because of the sin, of the collective sin of all of us. It's not that God is ready to strike you with uh, you know, some dread disease because you didn't do something right. Jesus comes into the world. We have no record that Jesus ever had a cough or a sniffle uh, because he was the perfect man. He was created in the same pattern that Adam and Eve were. I have a feeling Adam and Eve were never, never sick a day in their lives either. But the minute they began, the minute they sinned, the degeneration began, the degeneration of themselves and the degeneration of all of us. The entire genome has been affected and subjected to the, uh, the law of entropy, which is a downhill run all the way. Leprosy and paralysis represent a need for forgiveness, which is what everyone, every single one of us needs. And these two men both came to Jesus. Notice he didn't go to them. They came to him because they knew that he was the one who had the answer and had the ability to meet their need. But he was totally willing and took care of that need and their sins were forgiven as he promises to forgive all of us. We might, in reading the miracle stories of Jesus, might think, well, hey, you know, we should all be performing miracles, right? Because we're, Jesus is our brother and uh, this is the church age and uh, you know, even among the apostles themselves, miracles were quite rare. And we don't see accounts of just miracles happening willy-nilly all over the place. They were very specific for specific purposes. And even today, when true miracles happen, they are for a specific purpose. I remember reading a story about a missionary who went to, to a South Sea island. I don't remember uh, any of the particulars. Uh, and he went to the head man of the tribe and uh, he said, I want to live among you and I want to teach you about Jesus. And the chief said, okay, we have one test. He says, I'm going to give you an egg, a raw egg, and we're going to go over here by this hut, you know, or it was a long house actually, so it was probably about 40 feet long and just, you know, a framework with grass over it. And he says, and you throw the egg over the long house, and if the egg does not break, you're in. So he threw, you know, I'm sure he prayed. And he threw the egg, and every, all the tribesmen ran around the, uh, the longhouse, and he heard a bunch of cheering from the other side. And he said that he didn't know uh, whether they were cheering uh, because they were going to roast me for dinner tonight, or if uh, I was going to get to live among them. And he says they came running back around the longhouse with the unbroken egg in their hand. So it was good news for him. Once in a while, things like that happen. And, you know, sometimes we believe, you know, our prayers result in miraculous things. I was uh, uh, whitewater rafting one time, uh, not knowing how to do that. I was quite foolish, and I got stuck in what's uh, called a backwash situation. The water comes flowing over this way and then comes down into a hole and comes back this way and it just 
traps you right in there. And we tried all kinds of things to try to get unpinned from there. And it was finally we stopped and said, Lord, we're in your hands. And it was like, boom. It was like a, a hand of an angel just lifted us right out. It was pretty cool. Miracles maybe happen, you know, in, in our need. And sometimes they don't. I know in some cases people have prayed for miracles, you know, under persecution. They're uh, scheduled for execution and they don't get out of it. You know, God takes them out of this world. I don't know why. I can't answer that. Sometimes he fixes our problem miraculously and other times uh, he doesn't. But we're all going to uh, get to see him face to face someday and we're going to get to ask him. Let's pray. Lord, we're truly thankful that you have uh, come into this world with authority over our diseases, over our sin, over the uh, elements uh, of creation. And Lord, we see that you uh, are able to uh, speak to them, that you are able to negate the evil, that you are able to cast out demons. And Lord, we, uh, we pray that we will, when we, when we pray for miraculous things, that we are content with your answer. And sometimes your answer is no. But we, uh, Lord, we, uh, as we follow your path, we learn to accept uh, your no and rejoice in your yes. And we're thankful, Lord, that you have promised to bring us all to your kingdom. We're thankful, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.